Hi, I'm Busker James. Welcome to my channel. My video today is going to be a long one. It's 10 pages of what happened in part of my life starting in December of 1958 and basically going through till a few years ago. And it's called The Life and Times of a Busker. And uh, it just kind of gives a basic idea of some of the things that I went through in life as a child and growing up. And uh, it's a bit interesting in some of the things, some of the, um, some of the uh, problems that I had while trying to survive. Life and Times of a Busker. December 22, 1958, James Cunningham is born in St. Andrews, Scotland. James is the third child in the Cunningham family and is introduced to music the day of his birth. John Cunningham, who is the father of James Cunningham, is a professional accordionist and was taught to play the accordion by one of Scotland's best, Jimmy Shand. Between 1958 and 1966, growing up in Scotland was a nightmare. Remembering times of being underfed and times of domestic violence between my parents was beyond comprehension. I remember my parents splitting up for a while and my mother leaving me at four years old with my father and my older brother and sister. I remember being taken to my grandparents' place and physically abused by my uncle, my dad's stepbrother. Eventually, my parents got back together and decided to immigrate to Canada. During the waiting period, I recall my mother going into farmers' fields and stealing potatoes and vegetables to feed us. Two weeks before our move to Canada, we had to stay with my mother's parents in Glasgow, Scotland before boarding the ship to come to Canada. Time did not go fast enough for me. Finally, we were on board the Empress of Canada and on our way to a new beginning. A new beginning it was as we crossed the Atlantic Ocean in this ship that seemed like it was bigger than some of the towns I lived in in Scotland. We were treated to swimming, movies, and anything we wanted to eat. September the 10th, 1966, we arrived in Montreal and got aboard, train to take us to our destination in Red Deer, Alberta. Red Deer, Alberta was not what I expected. It was huge, lots of people, but very cold. We were put up in a hotel by an immigration officer, and my dad accepted a job on the farm the next day as a dairyman. I was enrolled in school at River Glen Elementary in Red Deer, which meant taking the bus every morning about 15 miles. School was okay, but I had trouble relating to other students with my Scottish accent. My parents dragged us around from place to place in central Alberta for a while and moved us to Calgary in 1969. We lived in low rental house, but many troubles started. My two older siblings kept running away from home due to many abuses by parents, by my parents. I was okay because I had taught myself to play the accordion and had a good relationship with my dad. I had lots of problems in school but kept on till I was 15. Then I quit and went to work for temporary manpower at $2.50 an hour. The pay at that time was good, but my parents took more than 75% of my pay for room and board. I continued with my music, performing with my dad, at parties, legions, dances, seniors' homes, and lots more. At age 16, I got involved with an older lady who my parents did not care for, so my mother ordered me out of her home one winter's night. Temperature that night was minus 47 with a wind chill. I crawled into a car that I owned, which had no gas in it, and I almost froze to death. My dad found me the next morning and took me to work with him. He had to keep rubbing my hands as they were blue 
from cold and frostbite. At age 16, oh, this was not how I wanted to live, depending on my parents. So I got a job at the Salvation Army driving truck, doing pickups for the store here in Calgary, Alberta. I was not very educated, but could see that the senior people in the Salvation Army were taking the top quality donations from the people and selling them outside the store. This was not honest and I could not work for people like that, so I moved to Kelowna to get away from the ongoing problems in Kelowna. So I moved, sorry, so I moved to Kelowna to get away from the ongoing problems. In Kelowna I started a job at a company called AGM and was there for a long time. I was told that my parents had split up again, but I kept working. One day my dad showed up at my doorstep in Kelowna and needed a place to stay, so I invited him in and looked after him for a, quite a long time. I bought a car from my dad on, on payments that he had and kept up the payments even after he returned back to Calgary. One month I uh, didn't have enough for the car payment, so I called my dad and told him. He replied that if I did not come up with the money immediately, he would send the police after me to collect the car. I did not know any different then because I was so young. A short while later I heard on the local radio station in Kelowna for me to contact the RCMP for a family emergency. I did not call them because I thought my dad was making good on his promise to send the police after me for the car I bought from him. A few days later I decided to call the police and they gave me a number to call in Calgary. I called the number in Calgary only to find out that my 22 year old brother had committed suicide and also killed his two kids two and three years old. What else could go wrong? I refused to believe it until I got to Calgary and saw them laying in caskets in the funeral home. We buried my brother and his two kids in Queens Park Cemetery in August of 1979 and tried to carry on with our lives. I could not go back to Kelowna so I moved to Prince Rupert BC. I got a job unloading abalone from a fishing boat called the Scotia Cape, which sunk on the north coast of Vancouver Island a few years later. While in Prince Rupert, I started to play my music more often, and I got, also got a job driving cab for Skeena Taxi. I brought more money on the driver payroll than any other drivers in the history of the taxi company. I was good at it and eventually bought my own cab and continued to drive 14 hours a day, 7 days a week. And after a few years I got tired of the lady I was living with. Since age 16 I was 22 years old and wanted to have kids so I left her and met my current wife. This stirred up, up, up the pot a little more as my ex-girlfriend was extremely jealous and tried everything to split us up. This was not going to work so I left Prince Rupert with my new girlfriend, lost everything I had to the bank and went back to Red Deer, Alberta and was married July 15th, 1982. I drove cab in Red Deer for a while but, uh, but did not like it as much as Prince Rupert. In 1983 my wife became pregnant with our first child few months later, a car rear-ended my vehicle and caused neck and back problems for me. I got a settlement of $1,000 for the accident and decided to go back to Scotland to see if I may be better off there. My son John Jr. was born November 5, 1983, and I had bought return tickets to Scotland for myself my wife and my son. The doctor who delivered John decided that he was going to try and stop me from taking my son to Scotland and I had to challenge him with the help of three Catholic priests and my mother. 
Eventually we were on our way. We stayed six months in Scotland and realized that we were worse off than in Canada, so we returned in April of 1984 with three suitcases and nowhere to live and no money. We hitched a ride back to Red Deer where my younger sister and her husband looked after us for a while. I got a job at Parkland Auction in Red Deer as a ringman during the sales. It was interesting but the auction closed down a year later. We, f we were forced on to the welfare with our second child on the way. James Jr. was born March 2, 1985. My older sister lived on Vancouver Island and invited us to move out there. So we packed up and away we went. Living on the island was somewhat of a challenge. It seemed like if you weren't born there, you were not welcome there. Nanaimo. Typical Nanaimo. My wife was pregnant with our third child at that time, so we had to stay put. Heather Cunningham was born December 26, 1986. I spent many hours and drove 120 kilometers a day to look after Heather since my wife was very ill and could not care for her. We were living in Cedar, which is south of Nanaimo at that time, but moved to Nanaimo as soon as we could get a place. Once again, I continued performing in places such as the Crowen Gate Pub, the Palace Hotel, the Cassidy Inn, the 256 Legion, Number 10 Legion, but I still wanted to go back to Red Deer. One night about 4 a.m. I got a call from the Nanaimo RCMP. My older sister had been raped a block from her house in Cedar. I went to take clothes to her at the hospital in Nanaimo and continuously shook my head asking myself, why do I stay here? I was busking regularly at the local liquor store at Timberwell Park in Nanaimo, but the Ministry of Human Resources caught me and told me to start claiming my busking money or get cut off assistance. This made my mind up for me. I packed up everything we owned and went back to Red Deer. We stayed in a 14-foot trailer for a while, and I got a call one day to start work with Richard Hartley Auction Services. I was the first employee hired to this new company. By November 1st, 1989, our fourth child was born, Jason Cunningham. I worked many years with Richard Hartley and became an auctioneer. I also done many household estimates for the auction, bought furniture for resale, moved furniture and done charity auctions as an auctioneer. I also had the pleasure of working on occasion for Bud Haynes Auctions, who sells antiques. I also took a second job as a janitor for the Knights of Columbus Bingo Hall and volunteered for every organization as a worker selling cards. I must have sold over a, a million dollars worth of cards in 13 years. This went on for a few years and during these years I purchased a mobile home from my boss at the auction and paid it off in six years, a total of $22,000. I also was performing on a regular basis at the Red Deer Farmers Market with my older son John who was just learning to play the accordion. By 1994, our fifth child was born, Robin Cunningham, was born July 7, 1994. I continued to push my musical skills. I recorded four cassettes and collected five trophies and one medal at the International Accordion Championships in Kimberley, BC. Two for second place in my age group, two for second place in duets with my dad, and two for third place in bands. It seemed like it was time to move again, so I approached a mobile home lot in Red Deer, Alberta, and was granted a personal loan on a new show home. The home was put in place, and I used my $22,000 mobile home as a down payment on this new home. Things were fine till a few months went by and the new home started having serious problems. 
I was told that the warranty only covered certain things, so I would have to pay for the repairs on my own. No way. I took the keys of the new home into the bank and threw them at the manager and walked away from it. $22,000 loss. Just a short time later, I declared bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy. Besides, these Alberta winters were causing lots of pain to my body. I was always in the hospital for back pain related to the cold. I moved back to Nanaimo May 31st, 2001, and this story goes on. I was allowed on welfare when I met the criteria for assistance in Nanaimo. That's okay, I always could busk now that my youngest son Robin was playing guitar and wanted to be busking. Busking in Nanaimo was going well. The city had designated spots. You buy a license and away you go. Not so far as the Port Authority is concerned. Federal government. Regardless, if they are part of the city of Nanaimo and agreed to busking spots on federal land for buskers use, they decided to change the rules of the busking spots to conveniently satisfy themselves. At the same time, uh, Mayor Gary Corpin tells a radio talk show that buskers are panhandlers with guitars and people like George Hansen who was the CEO of the Downtown Partnership Association, um, was reporting things to the Lethbridge Herald newspaper in Alberta that the amount of panhandlers in Nanaimo has been reduced since busking licenses are now mandatory. What an idiot. What planet do they come from? Buskers are not second-class citizens and panhandling has nothing to do with busking. As we continued to busk on Port Authority property during the summer of 2001, obeying the bylaws that were given to us, it appears that these rules are no, they no longer apply to the Port Authority. They make the rules as they go along. Federal Government. First of all, if you are a licensed busker and I'm on a Wednesday evening, you cannot busk on Port Authority property because they have changed the rules without consultation with the Nanaimo buskers, including myself. They tell me that the Port Authority has now hired buskers to play on our designated busking spot that we paid for without a permit and can busk at the same time. If it sounds unfair, that's because it is. So one of the licensed buskers, Michael Patrick, who performed with the band Wonderbread, says to me, this is not right, do they have a license? I said, I don't believe so, but why don't we find out? Wednesday night came along and Michael did not show up where this group was playing. I was there and asked the leader of the group, if they had a license and his reply was I think so but we are here by invitation well that's fine I said but I am so I am the difference is I have a license to play here and you don't eventually the police were called and it was found out that according to city bylaws for busking the group was in violation of the busking bylaw of the day and were told to buy a license. It never happened. The Port Authority shut down the busking spot and to this day still allow unlicensed buskers to busk there. This was not the end of, for my family of buskers. We were good at what we were doing and people of Nanaimo loved us and so did thousands of tourists that visited Nanaimo every year. We were using portable amplifiers to enhance our voices, but during a review of the busking bylaw, I believe it was in 2002, amplification was banned for vocals. I was severely beaten by two teenagers during a home invasion in August 31st of that year, 2001, just shortly after the incident at the Port Authority busking spot. Very strange. 
That beating changed my life. I continued busking and fought for the right of, to busk without being harassed by police officers and bylaw officers, which would happen on a regular basis. On May 12, 2003, the city of Nanaimo adopted a new busking bylaw to limit the amount of busking time for buskers. And they also put colored spots in place for different days of the month. Even after my family and I done delegations at city council on many occasions requesting that they be fair and allow proper busking rules for buskers. We done protests, radio interviews with CHLY Radio in Nanaimo. We traveled to Vancouver to do talk shows with Rafe Mayer about busking in Nanaimo twice. We wrote letter after letter to the editor and all of the Nanaimo newspapers, but Gary Corpin, the mayor of Nanaimo, and his staff would not budge. On July 11, 2003, my family of buskers decided to protest the new bylaw with civil disobedience. And because we could not stop people from giving us money, we were given $300 in fines by Nanaimo RCMP. We disputed the fines, but the city of Nanaimo went immediately into a court injunction in a court and gave us court papers on August the 5th, 2003. Just shortly after, the Nanaimo judge gave the city of Nanaimo a court injunction compelling us to comply with the busking bylaw, even though we were performing on on federal land where the city of Nanaimo have no jurisdiction with that, that particular bylaw. How ridiculous. We were complying with the bylaw in the first place. We have the right to protest and, and uh, protest any bylaw, and that is what we were doing. With an opportunity from a judge, from the judge that gave the injunction, I put in a statement of defense but was ignored to this day. The city of Nanaimo lawyers indicated to me via email that the city of Nanaimo did not wish to pursue the matter any further. I wonder why. My family and I were living in a house on Victoria Road and Milton Street in Nanaimo from December 2001 to October 2004. During this time we were educated lots about prostitution, drugs, crime, and who not to depend on when you need help. Number one, the city of Nanaimo. Number two, the Nanaimo RCMP. For three years I made call after call to the RCMP to deal with the prostitutes interfering with our privacy in front of our home. All members of my family were threatened and verbally abused and kept on their guard at all times. My youngest son, Robin, who was eight years old at that time, was scared to go to school because of prostitutes harassing him every day. The Nanaimo RCMP asked us to monitor the Johns picking up the prostitutes, write down license plate numbers, and report them to the Nanaimo Drug Squad. We took the advice and recorded over 300 vehicles picking up prostitutes over a very short period of time. The list included teachers, mailmen, moving company drivers, businessmen in $40,000 vehicles, and the owner of the Palace Hotel in his black Hummer and other business owners in the Nanaimo, and many, many more. I was also asked to be a part of the restorative justice sessions as a representative of the community to indicate how the prostitution and drug problem in Nanaimo had affected my family. After three years and hundreds of letters to the mayor in Nanaimo, the police, chief in Nanaimo and all senior staff in Nanaimo about my concerns relating to the prostitution problem. It was time to do a delegation at City Council about prostitution. I prepared my delegation along with a delegation by my daughter Heather. We went to Council. We were asked by Councillor Sherry not to proceed with the delegation because of ongoing investigations about prostitution in Nanaimo. We agreed but went back to council two weeks later and presented our delegations to council. The current mayor at that time, Mayor Gary Corpin, tried everything to stop me from speaking on the issue but had no choice as the other councillors accepted my request to speak. Mayor Gary Corpin walked out of the room 
while I spoke, but it seemed like I was wasting my time. Counselor Bill Holdham was badgering me about coming to council to speak on prostitution. He told me that I was to take all my concerns to the Nanaimo RCMP. I told him that I had done that for three years, but nothing had changed. That's why I was at council. Councillor Jeet Man has asked me what I think they should do to solve the problem. I told him to give me his paychecks and I would like to look after it. In October 2004, it was obvious that the city of Nanaimo nor the RCMP had the power to deal with the problem of prostitution or they did not want to. I moved my family to Comox in December 2004. We attempted to busk in Comox, but were told if we busk, they would take legal action against us. The mayor, Scottish mayor. I prepared to a delegation for Comox Council, asking to have busking bylaws put in place for buskers. After a few months of pressure and help from the media, a busking bylaw was put in place with outrageous fees for busking. I did not buy a license. June of 2005, our lease was up in our home in Comox, so we moved to Duncan and ended up living in a campsite because we could not find a place to rent. Homeless. For the first time in 24 years, I continued to look for a place for my family to live and ended up in a motel unit in Crofton, B.C. on Vancouver Island. This was supposed to be a temporary situation, but rents in the area were skyrocketing. It would take 60% or more of my income to get a home to live in. One month living in Crofton, my two sons started to sell drugs for cash to the local teenagers. They were drinking regularly and the stress for me was building. In October 2005, I separated from my wife after 24 years of marriage and returned to Nanaimo with my youngest son, Robin. I enrolled him in school and spent my days at home. On weekends, I would bus to help me survive as the federal government were very slow at providing child tax benefits for my son, Robin, at that time. In December 2005, I was told that my wife was involved in drinking on the regular occasions and was allowing drinking by my teenagers in the motel unit. She did not have any control over the situation. I made arrangements with my wife to have a meeting to discuss our plans for the future. We decided to reconcile. I immediately went to the motel and took control. With my wife's permission, I escorted all the teenagers out and told them there would be no more drinking in the motel unit and they would have to find another place to party. By December 23, 2005, my wife was living back with me in Nanaimo. During the time we were living in Nanaimo, from 2001 to 2004, I applied for, for, sorry, for, for provincial disability. After reconsideration requests and a tribunal, I was granted disability one status on a Friday afternoon but on Monday, legislation had changed by the Liberal government, which eliminated Disability One status, so I had to start all over again with a 23-page assessment application. By six months, I was granted PWD status for meeting the criteria under the Persons with Disability Act. PWD is Persons with Disability. To this day, I still see prostitutes on Victoria Road and Milton Street where we lived. I still hold a valid busking license in the city of Nanaimo. I recognize that rents have increased out of control for low-income families. A lot of disabilities are not visible, such as mine or my wife's, but with disability status in BC, each person with a disability should be treated with respect wherever they may be. Gary Corpin, the mayor of Nanaimo, who in my opinion does not like music, will have to grow up and deal with it. We are not going away and love a challenge. It is very clear that we are here to stay. Early February 2006, while I was at the casino in Nanaimo, I was told that a friend of mine had passed away, Paul Jackson. Paul was a fiddle player who was out 
busking in rain or shine. I had the pleasure of performing with Paul many times. Paul died in the Salvation Army homeless shelter in Naimo. What was going on in his life? I'm not sure. He was living in Coombs, the last I heard. What went wrong? I'd done my part by performing at a jam session at the Elks Club in Paul's honor. The weather is getting better now, and busking on weekends is a regular thing for me, my sons. On March 11, 2006, I was busking with my boys John and Jason at Georgia Park in Nanaimo between 2 and 4 p.m. Just a little after 4 p.m., a guy came along and was checking out the poster in my case to find out who we were. He seemed to be a bit mad, but he left and headed for the high-rise on Front Street behind where we were busking. We were packing up anyway, so we headed for the parking lot just in time to see a police car pulling in. As we were loading my van, the police officer stopped by my van and carried on. Could it be that the guy was so nosy looking in our case for a few minutes earlier called RCMP on us? It's happened before. Well, they didn't get us this time. A week later, I was out busking at Frank Ney statue on the waterfront, March 18, 2006. I arrived about 2 p.m. Everyone was enjoying my performance. I had a bit of a crowd gathering, and eventually the bylaw officer came along. Vanita Roberts was her name. Are you not over your time, she says. I said, possibly. Did you get a complaint? At, that, at the same time, I was wondering how she could have known how long I was there. She hadn't been around for the past few hours. Our conversation continued as I explained what had happened with the RCMP the week before, and I told her that I was not prepared to put up with harassment from RCMP or bylaw officers. Performing a few minutes over your time is not a crime, and there was no one waiting to take over the spot. I just want everyone to obey the bylaw, she said, as she stopped an older gentleman on a bike and told him to walk. I told Vanita Roberts that my past observations of her enforcement of the bylaws clearly show that the bylaws only apply to certain individuals, and more so if it's my family. Vanita assured me that she will be applying the bylaws to all who violate them. I accepted that assurance and told her this conversation is over. The next day, March 9, 2006, my son John and I were busking at the Frank Ney statue again from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. We moved over to Georgia Park to prepare for busking between 2 and 4. On the way over to Georgia Park, I noticed a couple of young people with a blanket spread out on the grass. They were selling jewelry. There was also a native carver next to the jewelry seller showing his carvings for sale. Now let me go back to the day before less than 24 hours. Did Vanita not tell me I was applying the bylaw to all who violate them? This is weird. Vanita has passed by these people at least three times in the past hour. They don't have a license, so why are they allowed to operate a business without a license? But for buskers, you have to do an audition, attend a boring three-hour workshop, and don't attempt to violate the street entertainer's bylaw or it could result in a finer possibility of jail time. There's definitely something wrong with this part of my story. Vanita and her husband monitored our show between 2 and 4 and did not say a word to me. Could it be that she told me one day she would enforce the bylaw and the next day do nothing to violate it? Perhaps. I was always told by other buskers that Vanita was going to be a problem, but I told them that the Vanita I know, we get along very well and so far have no problems communicating. Maybe it is the uniform that says bylaw officer on it. I'm told once in a while that a bit of authority sometimes goes to your head and you don't care who you decide to pick on when wearing a bylaw uniform. 
Let's consider a year ago when Dave Nichols, the head of bylaws, Nanaimo decided to send officers to over to protect Shed Island to ticket an 11-year-old girl for selling Kool-Aid. Where is Dave Nichols now? I remember I watched it on the national news. What a fool. This is the same Dave Nich Nichols who implemented the court proceedings against my family of buskers in 2003. And after court, he used his illegal injunction to try and put us in jail in front of the library in the presence of Darren Kiddick from the city of Nanaimo and the RCMP a few days after court. Let's get the facts straight here, people. Who perform music, sing, dance, do magic tricks, carve things out of wood, make and sell jewelry, put rocks together in a nice pattern on the water, or sell portraits of their work all fit into one category. Donating whatever their profession is to the public for money. It's all one word. Busking. There is no other imaginary definitions of busking that the city of Nanaimo or the Nanaimo Port Authority can create to change the facts of reality. The definition of a busker will always remain the same after we are all gone. As I prepare to, for to do a delegation at council about a review for the current busking bylaw, all of these things are on my mind. Mayor Gary Corpin only knows me to speak. Sorry, Mayor Gary Corpin only allows me to speak for five minutes at, at a council meeting, so everything else I want to say is on paper. I document everything that I see in relation to busking or so-called enforcement of bylaws and will continue to do so as long as I am a busker in Nanaimo. I will buy another license in April of 2006 to keep Mayor, Gar Mayor Gary Corpin happy and it will give the city of Nanaimo $20 more to waste on things that never get done. I'm sure there will be another 20 pages to add to my life as a busker before the end of summer. This is all done up to 2006 and now we're in 2011. I've moved to Calgary and uh, I've gone through a legal battle with uh, the city of Nanaimo and dropped it all because it's taken its toll on, on me and my health. and. Uh, it's time for me to um, to enjoy life a bit and, and be with my family here in Calgary, Alberta. I may um, may put some more on, and this is a long video, and but it tells a lot about what I've gone through in my life and uh, what the last 10 years in the city of Nanaimo has been like. I'm Busker James, and thank you for watching my channel, and uh, please comment on on anything that I have on here and I'd be happy to answer to you. I'm Busker James and thanks for watching.